Thank you very much. What a great hymn that was, wasn't it? You know? That hymn book is a real um, treasure trove. We used to use that at um, Bible Passing Church in Blackpool. And, um, you know, Pastor Curry, he'd never, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't have any uh, folly in the pulpit, uh, especially with the singing. Uh, and he would always use that hymn book. And uh, I've got that at home with guitar chords in it. And I use it every morning when I'm having my quiet time. And uh, that's a hymn that I've never heard in all the years that I've had that book and I've known that hymn book. I've never heard that hymn before. But there are many like that in that book. And uh, But we can thank God that, um, you know, he's left us some good hymns. Right, lovely to be with you tonight. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. And verse 15. And uh, Paul, here, speaking to Timothy, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's just have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time, Lord, tonight. Lord, just to spend in your precious word. We ask, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just help me now, Lord, as I just bring some truths from your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding tonight and help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Right, I don't know if you've ever read the Bible um, in all your, the years that you've been a Christian and you've, um, you've come across a verse and then you've read another verse and they look like contradictions. You think, how can those two things match how can those two things be reconciled and uh, there are many times when we look through scriptures we're going to have a look at a few tonight um, and if we don't really get a, a good understanding of what's happening then we're going to miss some important truths from the bible and uh, you know we don't we don't know it all we're still learning you know we've not made it yet but the holy spirit is there to guide us and uh, the truth is in this book and uh, he will lead us into all truth as, he, as he's promised um, Ephesians chapter 4 if you'd like to uh, just turn there and what I'd like to speak about tonight is the Christian's standing versus his state uh, some people like to uh, call it um, um, position versus practice and um, it's basically the same thing but tonight we're just going to have a look at standing versus state and I'll uh, I'll make it hopefully clear what I'm what I'm going to be teaching tonight um, Ephesians 4 and verse 22 and uh, what I'd like to, to see tonight is that the Bible declares that as a Christian we have a dual nature there are some Christians who don't like the thought of that and, you know, I've heard preachings in the pulpit, um, but I would like tonight just to try and help us to understand um, this truth about our standing as a Christian versus our state. Um, the Bible declares that we as Christians have a dual nature. We can call it the old man and the new man. Um, Ephesians 4 and verse 22, we see here uh, Paul is speaking to Christians. We know that because in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul here is writing uh, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's speaking to Christians here who are saints and who are faithful saints. Okay? Um, so he's not talking to unbelievers, he's talking to the, the Christians. And he's saying in verse 22 of chapter 4, he says, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. That's the former life that we used to have as Christians. He says, the old man which is corrupt 
according to the deceitful lusts and then he says and be renewed in the spirit of your mind so we see here the old man in verse 22 and he's telling them what they're to do now that they're to be renewed in their in the spirit of their mind and in verse 24 it says and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness and we see here the two natures together we see the old and we see the new um, John Knox um, he wrote a book it's called the law and rightly dividing the word reconsidered and there is a chapter in that book about the standing and the state of the Christian and it's really worth reading it's really good and uh, this is where I've got some of this teaching tonight and you know I've uh, obviously looked at the Bible and the Lord's you know given me um, an understanding of it more of an understanding um, he says this he says that our standing as Christians is how we are viewed judicially in the eyes of God on the base basis of the finished work of Christ I'll just say that again our standing is how we are viewed judicially judicially in the eyes of God on the basis of the finished work of Christ if you just turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and I'd just like you to see when we're talking about standing um, what, 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 um, what we're talking about it's like when we're, we're standing we're standing upon the rock and that rock is Jesus and he cannot move he cannot change and we are stood as Christians on that rock this is our standing uh, verse 30 Paul says but of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption and this is our standing tonight as Christians this is what he has made us this is how we are viewed in the eyes of God the Bible says here that in God's eyes we are righteous we've been made right we are sanctified which says which means that we are set apart and the Bible says here that we are redeemed we're redeemed through the blood of Christ we've been bought and it's the finished work and that is our standing tonight as Christians that is how God views us as Christians we may not see ourselves like that we may not feel like that but that's what the Bible teaches that is our standing tonight amen we're redeemed and we are standing upon Christ to the solid rock that cannot move 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 here's another verse to nail this teaching of our standing 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 speaking about the Lord Jesus it says for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin then it says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him this is our standing tonight we have been made righteous not because of our goodness or of anything that comes from us but it's of him our righteousness is of God through Jesus Christ that's wonderful truth tonight and that's my standing and no matter how I may feel tonight how I may how depressed that I may feel in the week my standing is is that I am righteous in his sight that's wonderful news our state let's just have a look at a few scriptures but John Knox says this about our state as a Christian is how we are viewed by man on the basis of our own merit let me just share a few scriptures if you just turn to Matthew chapter 5 our state is how we are viewed by man on the basis of our own merit this is what man sees on the outside okay or what he should see this is how this is our how our state should be Matthew 5 and verse 16 Jesus says let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now this is how our state should be. If we are standing, if we are being true Christians, the world should be seeing the light of Jesus Christ from our lives. He says, let your light so shine before men. God wants men to see something of him in us. And he says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants to be glorified. And he wants, our, he wants his light to shine in this dark world. Let's just turn to another scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Speaking again about our state. How we are viewed by man on the basis of our own merit. And our own merit. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Peter says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. And Paul, uh, Peter here is basically saying that our character, our testimony, it should be honest among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, those that are lost, those that are living in darkness. And he says, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, you know, they may try to bring accusations, false accusations against us as Christians, but he says this, he says that they may see your good works, which they shall behold, and glorify God in the day of visitation. So, there is a standing, and there is a state, there is a position that we have in Christ, but there is a practice that we are to follow as Christians. John Knox said this, he says, The objective of the Holy Spirit in a Christian life is to bring our state into line with our standing. I like that. That's basically what the Christian life should be about. It's about bringing our state into line with our standing. Um, I've wrote here that failure to interpret correctly this teaching will bring confusion. I'm going to mention a few reasons why. But you know in the Bible, it says that we are saved as Christians. But it also says that I need to work out my own salvation. And you know, if I just take those two scriptures at face value and I don't really look at the, the meaning of those, I'm going to think that there's a contradiction there. I'm saved, yes, hallelujah. But the Bible says that I need to work out my salvation. What does that mean? Does that mean that I need to do good works in order to be saved? Well, we're going to look at that in a, in a few moments. Um, but I've come across at least two times in my Christian life where I've seen that teachers have had a wrong interpretation of this. One was in the pulpit a few years ago. Um, I don't believe it's anyone that, that you, you know maybe in this, in this fellowship here tonight. But this person basically came into the, uh, into the pulpit and uh, basically said at the start of his preaching is that this is a new teaching. This is a teaching that not many Christians preach and this is a teaching that you don't hear in this church. And he basically said that if we are Christians tonight, or this morning, he said that we, we have only one nature and we don't sin and as soon as I heard those words it started to make me think and I had to go back and I had to look at some of the scriptures and I telephoned him a few days later and to just give him a few reasons why I, I believe that what he was teaching was incorrect um, there was another time where I'd only been a Christian maybe about a year and I went to a Bible study in Blackpool and uh, this young man was in his home and this Bible uh, study wasn't um, authorised, if you like, by, by the pastor or by the elders. Um, anyway, I went along as a, 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 you know, quite a new Christian and he basically taught that if we are Christians, we cannot sin. Okay? And he basically came across the scripture where it, it teaches about um, 
that uh, what, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, you know. And he's basically saying that as Christians we cannot sin because we're born again. Um, I didn't get too far in my Christian life to realise that that didn't work out, okay? <laughs> because I realised that I was a sinner still, even though I'd been saved. But I want to look tonight at a few reasons why we could get um, confused if we don't know what the Bible's teaching here. Um, we are in a battle. I don't know if you've realised it yet. I don't know if you've come across any spiritual battles in your Christian life. But if you haven't yet, um, and you've been a Christian a while, then you've got something to worry about. Because... Um, we're going to, we, we go through battles, if we're honest, tonight. And it's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. It's a battle between the carnal nature and the spiritual nature that we have as newborn babes in Christ. Um, let's have a look at this uh, fight that is on. I think one of the best books to look at this is Romans. Uh, if you just turn to Romans chapter 8, and uh, we see here in this verse here that he's speaking about the creation waiting for the adoption um, and, and the redemption of the body um, and it says in verse 19 Paul says for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God the creature the creation is waiting for something that's going to be revealed in the sons of God Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. There is something coming. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. We know that this is going to happen. We know that in the millennium, we know that there, are going to, that there, are, that there is going to be life upon this earth that will not die. And I believe that's speaking about our lives as, as humans, but it's also speaking about uh, animal life as well. If we know that the whole creation, sorry, verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That's the reality right now. And not only they, but we are, but ourselves also, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Christians are born again. We have the Spirit of God. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not that is seen not. Sorry, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And our hope is in our redemption, the redemption of the body. We don't have that yet. We're still living in these fleshly, carnal bodies. But we have the first fruits of the Spirit living within this carnal body. And the Bible declares that there is a fight going on. It's a spiritual battle when we're uh, Christians. Let's just have a look at this battle. Romans 7 and verse 15. And this teacher who got up in the pulpit, when I questioned him about chapter 7 of Romans, he basically said that this is speaking about a man before he was born again. Okay, and I went through the, the whole chapter with him and I tried to make it, make it clear that this was, this was a man who was born again, but he was having struggles with the old nature. Okay, if we just turn to verse 15... Paul uh, here is saying, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. You know, Paul called himself the chief of sinners. And if we've been a Christian for any amount of time, we will have that same feeling that Paul had. We will have some hatred towards the sinful nature. And we'll get ashamed at some of the things that we get up to. And we'll think, how did I ever do that, Lord? How did I ever say that? How did I ever think that? 
how did I ever react and respond in the way I did? There's a struggle going on. Paul continues, he says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. There is a good law. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's speaking here as a Christian. And he's saying that sin still dwells within him. He's saying, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. He's talking about his old, the old man nature. He's saying, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which, I, which is good, I, know, I find not. That's in the old man. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Notice how many times he's speaking about in me, with me. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. He's speaking about the born again man the, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man verse 23 but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members notice how many times it says in my members in, my, uh, in me dwelleth in me O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one who's going to free us one day from this body of death. When we get redeemed, he says, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let me just read you a quote from uh, Spurgeon about this verse. He says that every new, he says, in every new man is two men. The old nature and the new nature exist at the same time in each regenerate individual. That old nature the apostle calls a man because it is a complete manhood after the image of fallen Adam. It has the desires, the judgment, the mind, the thoughts, the language and the actions of man as he is in his rebellious state. Then he says, I am much mistaken if every Christian does not find this old man still troubling him. That the new nature cannot sin. It is as pure as the God from whom it came. We have a new nature tonight and that new nature cannot sin it's perfect it's the spirit of god and god cannot sin but our old nature our old man the flesh the carnal nature can still bring us down um, he goes on to say he says just as the lord has sworn to have war with amalek throughout all generations so does the holy seed wage war with inbred sin as long as it remains. I look forward to that day when my body is going to be redeemed. Hallelujah. What a day that's going to be when I'm out of this carnal body. I'd like to just give uh, some examples here. I think there's about four examples of our standing our, and our state. The Bible says that I am not yet perfect. But the Bible also says that I am perfect. Now that seems like a contradiction. But let's just have a look at two scriptures um, to see what this is meaning. If we just turn to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. And we see here very clearly that Paul says that he is not yet perfect he's not yet made it and he says in verse 12 he says not as though I had already attained 
either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended. He's not yet reached that place. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We see here that Paul clearly says that he is not yet perfect. Okay? And none of us here this evening can say that we have arrived. We're not perfect yet. That's our state. Okay? What about our standing? Let's just have a look at verse 15 of chapter 3. Paul says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. We see here that in God's eyes, um, this is my testimony. Sorry, um, this is my testimony. This is the testimony of a saved man who wants to be like Jesus. He testifies to his state as not yet perfect, yet he realises that his standing through the blood of Jesus is perfect. That's our standing. The Bible says that I am sanctified. But the Bible also says that I need to be sanctified. Sanctify means to be set apart, to be separated. Just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> and verse 11. And here Paul is speaking about the Christian stand. He says, and verse 11, he says, And such were some of you. And if we go back, we'll see that some of us, the Bible says, were fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, um, effeminate, thieves, covetous, etc. And he says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. That is your standing now, Christians in Corinth. You are washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've had your sin forgiven. And your standing here in verse 11 is that you are sanctified. He goes in verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. That is their present state. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That is how it's happened. Through the Spirit of, of our God. Through the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been washed and we've been sanctified. You see our standing and our state. Um, let's have a look at another one. The Bible says that I am a new man. But the Bible also says that I need to put on the new man. How can we reconcile those two things? If I am a new man... Why do I need to put on the new man? Well, let's have a look. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. I hope I'm making this relatively easy for you to understand. It is a subject that um, we don't hear a lot of um, teaching on. or I, I, I haven't personally, to be honest. Uh, but it's something that we need to uh, study and we need to rightly divide the, the word of truth, the Bible says. Um, verse 9, I am saved. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9 says, Who have saved us, speaking about God, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Notice here the past tense. He says that we that who have saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. We're not saved by our works. 
but according to his own purpose. And this was done, the Bible says, before the world began. I don't understand fully, 100%, all the meaning that's in that verse. But what I do get out of this is that the Bible says that I have been saved. That's a past tense. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's wonderful. That is our standing. We are saved. Two, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. We are saved, but the Bible says that we need to work out our salvation. Verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my presence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he's not speaking here about works to be saved. Okay? These are works that follow salvation. These are works that men should see in our lives. This is speaking about our conversation and our testimony, our witness. And he's basically saying that we need to work out our own salvation and it needs to be done in fear and trembling. We need to realise that we are accountable for our Christian lives. The Bible says that we're going to be judged for it one day at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not going to be condemned, but we will be held accountable for our conversation. And um, again, this is, Paul here is speaking about our state. He's speaking about our practice as Christians what men should view in our lives. Um, let's have a look lastly tonight at the example of the life of Lot. Okay, um, If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like us just to see Lot's standing. Okay, His position with God. And um, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that it was an evil place. We know that sin was being practiced daily. And it was a terrible place to live. But this was the place where Lot had pitched his tent. And notice what it says in 2 Peter 2 and verse 6. It says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an, an example unto those that after should live ungodly verse 7 and I want you to hear I want you to see here the standing that Lot had with God it says and delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy, filthy conversation of the wicked verse 8 for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And in verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. You know, if this was all that was written about Lot, you would think that Lot was a godly example in the Scriptures. If this is all that was written about Lot, you would think that he would be at the top. He would be the example that we should follow. But you know, the Bible's not like that. The Bible tells the whole truth. We see the standing of Lot, but we're going to see the state of Lot. We're going to see his practice, okay? Um, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 19. It won't be much longer tonight. But um, hopefully we'll get something out of this before we leave tonight uh, so that we can apply it to our Christian lives. Genesis 19 and verse 7. And uh, the first question that I have tonight is what did Lot call the wicked Sodomites? Did he call them Sodomites? Did he call them unrighteous men? 
how, how did he relate to them? What was his relationship with these people? Notice what it says in verse 7, chapter 9. We know in the story that um, these Sodomites came to the door of the house of Lot and they wanted to knock it down. And in verse 5, these Sodomites wanted to know Lot. So they wanted to have a sexual relationship with him. These were men, old and young. How wicked. I believe that we are getting to that time right now. You know, I was at, um, and you know, this is probably no reflection upon where I'm staying tonight. I don't know, but there were two girls walked into the into the um, accommod accommodation where where I'm staying tonight in this hotel, holding hands, and you could clearly see that these two were homosexual. But this is what we're seeing in our life today. We're seeing what's happening in the days of Lot. Let's see what Lot did in verse seven. How did he relate to these, these men? Uh, and Lot, in verse 6, went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. And verse 7, and said, I pray, ye, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. And we see here that Lot associates these people as his brethren. That's Lot's state. That was his practice. Lot pitched his tent with his brethren. Um, he called them his brethren. In verse 8, what does Lot offer these Sodomites? He says, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the, under the shadow of my roof. What does Lot offer them? He offers them his own flesh and blood. <laughs> he offers them his daughters so that they can have their sexual evil way with them. What man could do that with his own family? This is Lot. But this was his state. This was his practice. This is what men were viewing on the outside. Verse 14. What kind of a testimony did Lot have? Verse 14. It says, And Lot went out. This is when God brought deliverance. And he brought deliverance because Lot was a righteous man. And he didn't want Lot to get caught in God's wrath, which was going to fall upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think that we have a picture here of the rapture that you may be saved tonight and you will be saved but God knows how we are living tonight and we may get saved but we may be snatched out of the fire just like Lot was we need to be careful about our testimony let's just have a look um, at verse 14 and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And we see Lot's testimony here. He lost it. When these men looked at Lot, they probably thought, This man's been living amongst us. He calls his brethren. He even offers us his own daughters for, for us to have our sexual way with them. And now he's saying, get out. Judgments of God is coming. And we see here that they mocked him. Now this may be the reason why, why they mocked him. And you know, this can be the same with us as Christians. If we are not careful with the way that we live our Christian lives, when we try to witness to people they may just mock us and they may laugh and they may just say, you call yourself a Christian? Look at what you said yesterday or look. Look how you reacted the other day. See the importance of our state, our practice as Christians. We don't want to be mocked by people. We, we may get mocked because we are Christians, but let's not get mocked because 
we're walking in darkness. You know? Let's not be hypocrites. What about, did Lot leave willingly? Did he want really in his heart to leave that sinful place of Sodom? Let's have a look in verse 16. He says, and while he, what's the next word? Lingered. He didn't run out. He didn't get out immediately. It says, and while he lingered. And it says that the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife. They had to get hold of him to bring him out. He wasn't going anywhere in a hurry. But it's a good job that God had mercy upon him, wasn't it? It really was. Praise God for the, the grace and the mercy of God. It's wonderful. We don't deserve it. Lot didn't deserve it. But God saved Lot because he was righteous. Because of his standing. Because at one time he had put his trust in the word of the Lord. And he placed his faith in God. And the Bible says that we are, that we are saved by faith. And... Um, not by works. Saved by God's grace. What about, did Lot thank God for his deliverance? Verse 18, it says, And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. And we see here, um, verse 17, let's read it. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. You see, Lot didn't want to go to the mountain. And he says, not so, my Lord. He's refusing God's, God's word. He's refusing God's teaching. Get out. Go to that place. He's not thanking God. Okay? Unthankful. What about verse 36? What crime did Lot commit later? Um, we know that he went out with his daughters um, and we know that um, that his daughters had sexual relations with their father with Lot and it says thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father and we see here that Lot was a man that committed incest we know that happened in the church at Corinth don't we um, this was Lot's uh, practice. This is what Lot was doing. This is the crime that he had committed. Um, how do we account for such a contradiction here? Well, we see here that God saw in Lot a just man with a righteous soul. And that was his standing. Lot's neighbours saw a carnal, fleshly, worldly believer. And that was his state. Um, just if you'd like to just turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 it's got another verse to read after this one and then we're, we'll be through tonight 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22 and Paul says abstain that means get away don't have anything to do with it don't touch it don't be near it. Stay away. Abstain from all appearance of evil. This is the Holy Spirit here speaking to us as Christians. And he's warning us that we need to abstain from appearances of evil. Don't get involved with it, but don't even be near it. Get away from it, because it's going to have some effect. And you know, that is a good teaching for us as Christians, because sometimes we can taste or we can, um, we can try something that is sinful, and we get stunned by it. But it's dangerous. You know, when you get stung, when you get burnt, it leaves a scar. And that's what sin does. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That verse is speaking to Christians. 
not to unbelievers. We, we like to use that in, in the outreaches, but that verse is actually speaking to Christians. For the wages of sin is death. Sin doesn't bring anything that's good for the Christian. It doesn't bring life. It doesn't bring peace and joy. We need to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says that we, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And one last verse tonight. How do we bring our state into line with our standing? And, you know, thousands of messages could be preached on this tonight and we still wouldn't reach everything that God's Word says upon it. But I'm just going to read a, uh, a few verses here. The Bible says that we need to yield, which means that we need to give ourselves to something. Okay? Let's just have a look in verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. The Bible says, that ye should obey it in, in the lusts thereof. And then he says in verse 13, Neither yield, don't give yourselves over, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. And we have a choice tonight how we yield ourselves. We can yield ourselves unto sin, which leads to death, or we can yield ourselves unto God, which will bring life. And we have a choice tonight. We do have a choice. Because we're Christians and we have the Spirit of God living within us. Verse 14. What a wonderful verse this is. This should bring us hope tonight. It says, For, this, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Tonight, sin does not have to have dominion over us. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Then it says, What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Verse 16, Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or, or of obedience unto righteousness. And tonight... It's about yielding to the Spirit. It's about obedience to Christ. Yielding to the Spirit. We have a choice. Um, let me just finish tonight with uh, Charles Spurgeon. He says that we must go to heaven sword in hand all the way it's a spiritual battle that we're in tonight uh, before you go to bed tonight or before I'm going to bed tonight I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6 and I'm going to read I'm going to remind myself about the armour of God this book here is the offence goes on the offensive and we need to put on the new man we need to put on the armour of God and it needs to be a daily practice. And if we don't, we're not going to win the battle. Because the flesh and the carnal nature is very powerful. And we need to be wise tonight. We need to be wise. It's a lifelong struggle. And we're going to have that struggle until the day that our bodies are being redeemed. But we can thank God tonight. The Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over you. Wonderful. Wonderful promises. Let's just have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we'd just like to thank you tonight for our standing in Jesus Christ as Christians. We thank you, dear Lord, that we are standing upon the rock. And that rock is Christ tonight. And Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you that we cannot lose it. We cannot, because we are in Christ, and we are standing on the promises of God tonight. Lord, we've been singing tonight about revival. We've been uh, singing about revive thy work, O Lord. And we pray, dear Lord, that our um, state tonight will be brought into line with our standing. 
Lord, the Bible says that we should examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. Help us to examine ourselves tonight, each one of us, individuals. Are we in the faith? Are we walking in the Spirit? Are we yielding to the Spirit? Are we obedient tonight? Lord, help us, we pray. Have mercy upon us. We thank you for the grace of God tonight. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit will help us. Help us tonight, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.